feels like a lot of you are having issues uh, with blocking and I wanted to discuss that. Uh, blocking is a very simple concept, it's a very simple fundamental, so if you're not grasping it, there's something possibly, um, you know, wrong with the way you're imagining forms, you haven't sculpted enough, you're not drawing enough, you're not, um, there's a lot of mileage behind, uh, there's a lot of understanding that comes with a mileage, just drawing alone improves your ability to understand a concept, just exposing yourself to the activity reveals to you things that theory and words couldn't have uh, prepared you for. So, you know, you may have watched a bunch of videos on blocking, but you don't really know what its application is unless you drew, unless you actually spent time drawing, Kyle. Um, so the more you put out, the more you work on, the more you produce and work, the more you'll understand the very, very basic concept of blocking. Um, so what I have here open is Portrait Studio. Um, and Portrait Studio is an amazing uh, learning tool as well. It's not just for building big, wonderful, sparkly scenes uh, for illustrations or messing around with the lighting setup. It's, it's really important to get uh, sculpting in your experience, in your educational experience. Sculpting is something that will open your mind up to exactly what it is that we're aiming for when we draw in 2D. 2D is... Uh, is um, incidental. It's it's something that happens because we don't have the third dimension. If we had the third dimension, things would be very different. So having 2D art, uh, we're painting as if we're missing a third dimension. We're always thinking about volume, geometry, geometric anatomy, radial shading, um, uh, form studies. All of these are have one common thing, which is volume, which is 3D models. Uh, so when you're sculpting, you're getting the full picture. You're getting the whole thing. You're getting the whole deal. Uh, when you're when you're exposing yourself to sculptures that rotate, rotation is a massive chapter um, in your educational journey and in, in your art journey. Uh, rotation is um, what happens when you have three D space and an object can move within it and reveal its multiple sides. Your brain naturally wants to think in two two dimensional pictures. Your brain does not work like it doesn't have an interior dashboard like a 3D modeling program. It doesn't have an internal Maya or ZBrush with which to uh, process your images. It just gives you the flat images of memories. It tries to find an efficient way to uh, retain the information around you. So when you're blocking in a drawing, we're blocking in for many reasons to make the painting process easier. We're keeping our brush large so that we think of the general fundamental geometric anatomy beneath all shapes so that we um, get, the, get the main core shadows out of the way and address the light source. So one thing that I have here is I've combined the sphere, the low poly sphere, with the cube-like uh, shape over here. And I've combined them together to show you the basic fundamental blocks you should be starting with with your drawings. And um, I'm just going to... All shapes are customizable. I'm just going to enlarge this shape and I'm going to kind of use this section here for the cranium. Um, I'm, I think I'm going to elongate this as well and then just combine the two. So when I talk about uh, the beard shadow, I'm really talking about this sphere. You see this big sh line here? This is where shadows start to happen. So the very first block should be the beard shadow block. And once that is complete, then you th you're thinking about the side blocks of the temple. Um, so the light source, as you can see here, is perfect um, top-down light source, um, and it is what you should be working on with your th with you with all of your paintings. Um, it should always be a top-down light source, especially for 14-day challenge. It's the most common, most basic light source. And we raise this up. I'm just going to lower that dome. And I'm just going to th probably throw the cranium up here, or we still want to see the temple, so we're seeing some of the... And I'm just going to rotate this just to see if we can find the best shape. Yeah, probably not going to find it. And that's okay. I'll just rotate it back. Um, I should probably have chosen an even lower poly so that you can get the basic shape for the forehead, but hopefully you can understand that this is the forehead. 
So when you're blocking in, you're doing just this. You're just capturing the core shadow. So what is blocking in? It is working with a large brush to rush the core shadows necessary to complete the painting. You don't even need the sphere. Let's just remove the sphere for a second. You don't even need the sphere. All you really need is this core shape right here. You have a block, mid-tone, block for the highlight, block for the mid-tone, and block for the shadow. And as you can see, the temple, which is here, which is the front-facing part of the corners of the face, the temple, is lit in, in such a way where it's still a shadow, but it's nowhere comparable to the lower half and then the complete lower half of the face. Um, and what I did here was I combined the low poly female with the high poly female. Right? So I put one beside the other and I'm just combining the two again to show you how these eventually merge. I'm just trying to capture one without rotating. Oh, come on, you dick. Okay. I. I you. I'm sorry guys, I'm pissed off today. Um, so we have the blocks of the nose, all these basic blocks eventually combine. So I'm just going to show you. It's a different face, it's a different type of person, but essentially the same concept, except her cheekbones are a little bit higher. Alright, so you see all the side values don't compare to the eye blocking uh, the eye socket blocks, the nose shadows, sorry, don't compare. So there's no uh, value sharing. Right, so we don't have any um, bounce lights here and there. That, that we, I don't have enhanced lighting on just because I, I don't want to mess around with, um, you know, RAM and Photoshop and whatnot. But Okay, so we've got both axes selected right now, which is super annoying. I just don't want to rotate it because you guys, I want you guys to see it. Okay. So these are your initial blocks. This is your secondary blocking stage when you're starting to discover the detail, but still keeping your brush large, still early. <clears throat> and then of course, this is after you blend. And so one thing I'm gonna do with you guys right now is just take a screenshot of this lady here and blend her out for you. All right, so you can see that blocking and blending are, you know, you can, you have to provide more edges than you really need so that when you do blend, you're complete, you're done, the painting is finished. Maybe I should have zoomed in a little bit more to take her photo. Okay. I'm just using the on-screen on controls because I personally am not a fan of the controls. But that's some of the stuff, the mouse controls. So that's going to be something that we're going to be changing soon as well. That's why we constantly are updating Portrait Studio. We're, um, we're always uh, uh, you know finding one thing that we could improve, a control that we're... We're, uh, we're not a fan of and we want to improve or move in a different direction. Find better and more easy ways for the user to comfortably move the models around. So I'm blending with a large brush and for anyone interested in what this program I'm using, it's called Portrait Studio. It's going to be on sale this Friday at 50% off. So if you're interested in having a copy of this on your computer, it's a one-time buy, lifetime updates um, and you're getting it at 50% off. <coughs> this Friday on my store if you're interested in that. So I'm blending and let's just say the student is done blocking. I just want to show you how we transition from blocking to blending. And then I'll re-block the face here. Um, I'll copy paste this entire face, re-block it, and then superimpose the blocks on the face and then blend again to show you that blocking as a principle is, is, is a very, very simple concept. Blocking is the resulting habit that comes out of uh, understanding your geometric anatomy. So if you don't know what geometric anatomy is, you can't block, Kyle. <clears throat> so what do you have to know? Well, all the questions that I asked, 
We're very, very specific to each particular feature. What is the geometric origin shape of each feature? Okay, and then what do you do to capture the block of each feature? So I'm shrinking my brush wherever I get into kind of stronger bone structure. And I'm enlarging my brush when I get into more fatty pockets. Alright, and the stomach gets blunt. I mean the 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 God damn it, I'm so out of out of it right now. The stomach, uh I said it again. The mouth gets blended out with a large brush because it's very fatty. And then now we're using a s even smaller brush to blend out the nose. And you'll see in a second how all these blocks, the, the ones that we over provided are gone. The ones that we need are there. And then we end up with a completed face. So I'm just blending away with my smudge brush. If you want to blend like this, all you need is a smudge brush uh, combined with one of my brushes. It's a scatter brush. And it, they're just tailored to mimic what brushes do in real life when we're blending with a smudger. And you see how I'm not, I'm not erasing, I'm not blending to erase, I'm blending just to make sure that we're combining planes together through a more curved transition, especially on a female face. Planes transitioning in female faces are a lot more curved, a lot more gentle transitions. Right, and I'm just going to re-block the forehead just to make sure I'm not value sharing. And it's about maintaining borders in between areas. So remember that shape again, this shape, we're maintaining borders. All right, we're not Combining any of the upper neighborhood with any of the lower neighborhood with any of the neighborhood here. Um, so this shadow that you're seeing on the side, we don't see that because, again, that shadow is very different. The temple shadow is very different from the lower cheek shadow, which is where things start to turn away from the light, which is why we use the sphere as well. We open up the sphere to show us the different grades and neighborhoods and how they don't blend. Again, we're not seeing this side from our perspective. We don't consider this shadow because this shadow is on the other side of the camera, on the other side of the light source. So it has a core shadow in the back. So everything has a core shadow in the back, but we're not seeing the back. All we're concerned with is the top-down light source in this angle. And you can even shrink that shadow to have even less shadow. Make sure that the nose shadow doesn't extend too far into the mouth. But we're still having region shadows that don't blend. You can see here, lower cheek shadow moving down, upper cheek shadow, all the values are moving up. None of these values are shared. <coughs> so blending away. So blocking in requires a knowledge of the geometric anatomy of each feature, each you know, eye, nose, and mouth. If you don't know what geometric anatomy is, then you're going to have trouble blocking in the right amount, blocking in the core shadow to that light source. It's a very, very simple chronological theory here. You block in the larger thing of all the things, which is the head. And that's a very, very simple shape to remember, which is the cube combined with the sphere. If you don't know how to shade a cube and you don't know how to shade a sphere, you have no business attempting a face or a 14-day challenge. If you don't know what geometric anatomy is, you have no business attempting a 14-day challenge. You need to get back to your studies. And if studies are too boring for you, then art might be the wrong idea. Make sure that you know, you're prepared for the, the ugly footwork. You're prepared for that boring that you would call boring work, you get that out of the way, 
you can start attempting more complex combinations of those simple basics that you're walking through. But if they're all always boring to you, then we will have trouble, you know, obviously. Finding something of interest, you know, that you can study when it comes to art that will still benefit late game rendering. There's nothing really as beneficial as studying your geometric anatomy. Geometric anatomy is finding the origin shape of all the features, and they're all the same. Every human face is the same, bone structure-wise. All right. Strip the skeleton, uh, strip out the muscles and the fat and the tendons and the, and the ligaments and all of that, and you're left with the skeleton, and that should all, pretty much, if human genetics are, if it's a human, they should all look the same. So that's what we're doing here. If you know you've watched my channel for a while and you still find it difficult to pick up on the basics, um, you have to start attempting a different way of recording information. You have to start recording information uh, differently if, you, if it's hard to retain it after visual um, teaching the way I do with my before and after. So what I'm doing now is giving you a before and after. I'm giving you a visual representation by side by sides here. If all of this is, if you're not picking something up, then you need to start writing notes. You need to start revisiting critique hour recordings. You need to start uh, painting alongside while I paint. You need to start thinking of buzzwords that you can remember that help you, you know, recollect some of the basic fundamentals that I'm referring to for any particular feature or any stage of the rendering process. The way I teach is that I teach so that it's completely applicable to all learning styles. So even, even through my teaching, if you're not retaining any information, there's something fundamentally wrong with how you know, you're interacting with the information I'm giving. And I'm just raising the contrast here. Just because early stage, I don't like having the contrast. Porsche Studio gave me contrast because it's a software. It's going to give me all the contrast. I need to see the subject. But early stage, I like to keep black and, and darker grays out of the way. A lot of you have discovered that you have issues with your blending um, and your geometric anatomy and your core shadows. Core shadows are the god particle. Core shadows are the, the, the main theory, the theory of everything. They are what we need in order to complete any, vol paint any object and represent its volume. If you don't know where to put core shadows, you don't know what the volume shape is, so you don't know the difference between a sphere and a cylinder and when to use a cube and what the z-axis is. And if you don't know what the volume is, you're not going to know where to place that core shadow and you're not going to know one big essential thing, where the direction of the light source is. These, these are the building blocks of painting. So blocking in early stage is a reflection of the larger to smaller blocks that represent the core shadows per geometric anatomy per feature. So if I were to try to attempt to bridge the gap of understanding one more step and build like a skeletal formula the way we have in chemistry. So blocking in is essentially, so blocking equals blocking in equals geometric anatomy, which is large to small geometric anatomy. So let me use a diagram here again just to bridge the gap again. Large to small shapes, which means large to small brush. And what's large to small? Larger shapes versus smaller shapes and the larger brushes needed to take care of the larger shapes into the smaller shapes. Again, I'm walking in circles right now to make sure that we are as thorough in the application of this theory in the, in the listener's mind as possible. So what was the initial shape that we had to block in? This shape and this shape in different, in different moments we are blocking in. The top down light source separating neighborhoods per border. This is the border I'm talking about. 
and then addressing the fact that the head is both a combination of spherical core shadow signatures and cube for the z-axis and the sides of the temple here and here. And then once that's done, we start applying, we start removing, moving away from object into subject. So another part of this spectrum would be object, which is geometric anatomy. We're actually seeing shapes here. We can see cubes. We can see real shapes into subject, in which we're no longer working with geometric anatomy. Now we're working with organic signatures, which means we're blending, blending, and we stop seeing the shapes, we start seeing the object, we start seeing familiar features, we start seeing features. So large to small, object to subject, geomet geometric anatomy to the actual organic anatomy. Okay, cubes, and start seeing actual shapes, instead of seeing actual shapes, we start seeing the actual features, the actual anatomy. Okay? And none of this is possible without addressing where the light source is coming from, which is top-down. And how do you know how to place shadows on an object in a top-down light source? That is something that you learn on form studies. That's something you learn while working with form studies. If you don't know how to do form studies, you can't do any of this shit here. None of this. You can't do any of this. You won't be able to figure out how to block a human face. How? A human face is a combination of many shapes. And if you haven't learned how to draw these shapes, how are you supposed to combine tons of shapes together if you don't even know how to render a basic cube in light and maintain the edges required? And this, before we start blending, and by small I mean when we're adding more and more polys, we can zoom in and we'll eventually see all the little polys, but from a distance it looks perfectly cylindrical. It looks like a perfect circle. We zoom in into this particular area and we can see every single little poly. So that's why, you know, I, we're not going to block in every tiny little poly. That's stupid. We don't blend with a small brush. We just let the smudge brush address every single little poly because we're not going to be zooming in this much. Or honestly, it would be like this much of a zoom for us to see every single little polygon or surface or plane. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when we blend from a distance, things have a perfect gradient for the radial shade. Zoom in and you'll be able to see every single little individual bar of new value. But we're not painting like that. So the large to small eventually leads to radial shading. It's not that radial shading comes later in the painting process, no. It's that radial shading happens as you block. So you're going to block the first section and then the lighter second section. And then as you climb, you're adding more paint and your brush is shrinking. You can block. With a, with, with a blocking brush. You can radial shade, sorry, you can radial shade and blend with a blocking brush and then you get your smudge brush and blend the rest away, blend each uh, individual bar and edge away from that resulted in the blocking brush. That the blocking brush resulted in. But we can't, we wouldn't, it's not ideal to tell, I mean a professional may use a blocking brush to blend because they know what they're doing, they know the value that is being uh, addressed and they know the um, they know how to efficiently represent the, the, the best shadow in the light source. But, you know, obviously when it comes to working with a round tool, a round blending, it needs a round tool. Blocking needs a square tool, a block. It's in the word. So a student would ideally use smudge brush after blocking and a combination of smudge brush and soft brush, which is what I did to, to achieve this girl. It was a combination of the two, and I lowered the contrast. So obviously you're not going to be blocking as much as, as many planes as we have here. This is kind of an addition plane to every single, so we added a little shadow here for the eyebrow to show that there's a shadow for the eyebrow. We added an extra little elevation to show that little, the little protrusion in the, in the frontal lobe. We added little blocks here to show that the forehead also has its own plane changes. And this is the brightest highlighty, highlighty kind of spot that catches all the, all where the oil is that catches all the light. Added extra little planes to the side of the nose, little indentations under the nostril, but this again is a particular face. We're always talking about a particular face. Added the extended cylinder on the upper lip. There's always a, the cylinder of the upper lip extends all the way out to show that radial shading happens all the way out here. And sometimes we do have an interruption in the cheekbones before we enter the official kind of lower beard shadow of the chin. 
So these are, there's a lot of added for educational purpose, lots of added planes on this surface, uh, on, this, on this polygon, on this shape here. That you don't always need to use. You just need to get the basics down. And I didn't blend away the edge between the lips. I didn't blend away most of the nose. And I didn't blend away most of the eyes. So it looks a little soft, but we don't have any detail at the moment. But technically, zoom out. It looks perfect. It looks like a 3D model still because the light to, to shadow ratios are all accurate. None of the values up here are being used down here, and none of the values down here are being used up here. Look at what happens when I grab a value here. And again, if you're not picking any of this up, it's because you have a problem retaining information. It's not that the information isn't accurate enough or that you haven't found the right way of learning. Maybe you've been given all the ways that you need to learn. You just need to have more practice. You just need to practice more. You need to actually get in there and get the field work, get the, get, get the mileage down, get the steps in. This is values used from up here, down here. Look at that massive contrast difference. And the values down here, up here, look really, really dark. And that's how it's supposed to be. This is a healthy difference between the upper half of the sphere and the lower half of the sphere. So when it comes to this painting, which I'm critiquing now, I think it's a day one, 14 day chart. I don't know why your head is all the way up here. You need to make it so that the head is in the center where it belongs and not nearing the edges of the canvas. <clears throat> okay, and then you also have an issue here um, with the background value. Your background value is way too dark. Don't know what this line is, it might be me. And I'm just raising the background value a little bit. Okay, so if I were to block, what? If I were to block this piece here, so let's just, uh, why is it doing that? What? Why is it cropping the top of the head? What the hell? <laughs> that is so stupid. I have it. Everything was on deselect. What, what the flip? Okay. Okay. It's unusual. Okay. Um, so what you haven't done, so if we were to control C, um, and just turn this into a silhouette. What you haven't done is you haven't blocked technically on the silhouette. You need to make sure that your blocks are visible on the silhouette on the outside so that they're visible outside. And what are these blocks representing? Bone structure, changes in plane. So filter, liquefy, and I'm just adding these blocks in before I like start using lasso. And then I'll just copy paste each side because I don't have time to block in either side. But do you guys have any questions at all on this blocking? Do you guys have any comments on what you experience personally when you're blocking? No value sharing also applies to the background. Beautiful. Loving that. So I'm blocking the jawline. The head should not be round and small. This is an actual disease that, that we know of in the medical world when the head is that small and circular. It's not supposed to be. It's supposed to be rectangular and it has edges to it like you just saw. The head is more of a rectangular prism than a cube, though we're referring to the cube as the general mascot of the volume and the z-axis. So right now you have no idea what the geometric anatomy of the, uh, of the nose is. I'm getting rid of that. So these are the blocks. These are the blocks that we start with when it comes to painting. We do the very, very first block, which is probably the block of the, I mean, I, I'm not gonna give you a specific order. I'm not gonna paint for you. You decide, you're the artist. You decide where you think the best block is for the forehead, the best block is for the temple, 
So I'm just going to block them and you decide as the artist which ones are the ones that are important to you. Which are the ones you feel like you should start with. But I'm just going from top to bottom. And the value I'm applying to these, we ha I have to make sure that these values are not shared. And I'll go probably go back continuously. Okay, so I'm just going to block everything here. So blocking, again, is using your brush to represent the nearest core shadow plane to the geometric anatomy, the most relative core shadow plane. This is one big block, all right? This is also one big block. Again, if you're having trouble understanding this, it's a sign that you know you need to address your note taking and your study habits. Another block under the cheekbone, that's one block that I add, and it can be different shapes. I mean, you can make it triangular if you'd like, whatever you feel like you're trying to represent per the, per the feature. A lot of the faces that you guys start out with, and write this back to me, all the faces you've drawn right now, all the characters that have come through in your studies, are accidental. This is one very, very important block. It can be done with two brush strokes that I use for the cheekbones. One really massive important block is the eye socket, of course. And a lot of my brushes from my brush sets are... <clears throat> uh, are uh, designed to and promote blocking and they're also in the shape of the eye socket so you can see a lot of the skin and blending brushes all of these are in the shape of the eye socket and all you have to do is see that eye socket shape this is skin and blending brushes my blocking brushes are very very easy this one is in the shape of the eye socket a lot of the sketching brushes um, can be enlarged to, to, to blend with the blending brushes are very different. The smudging brushes combined with blending, it's, it's very different. Um, because it's about smudging, less than blocking. It's about reorganizing values. I'm on darken right now, and here's another block I add in. And I'm just editing this section, this entire upper section, to be of a different value. All of the characters you draw are accidental. Excellent. You don't know what, who you're drawing yet, because you're, you're, I'm sorry to say it like this, but you're such a beginner that you don't know tropes yet. You still have that lesson waiting for you on tropes. You're such a beginner, you haven't done a focus study on expressions yet. So all the expressions you're doing, you don't, you're not aware of. They're accidental. So it must be that the face you're drawing is also accidental. And it's okay to refer to yourself as a beginner. It's humbling. You're such a beginner, you haven't tested yet the waters of, of, of beauty. You know, what, what, what can I apply to make this face less or more beautiful? Do I really want 100% Barbie face? All the faces that you're drawing right now are Barbie. So this is one big block here for the nose. So never assume that this character that we're drawing here, if we're going to lose her character, that's okay. We're not losing much because it wasn't a face deliberately designed as a character just yet. Then I have a block for the side of the nose. I make sure the value I choose here is not one with value sharing in it. And then one massive block for the lower part of the nose. Again, you can work in any order you feel is the most optimal and the highest of efficiency. And then I'm going to take this face and superimpose it for both light and darken on the uh, face beforehand. And it's basically going to be a correction of all the problems that you had including the missing cheekbones and the jaw lines and all of that. And then we're going to blend. Okay, and I'm just locking this layer, making sure temples don't need to be that dark. This area here doesn't need to be that dark. 
So never sweat, never sweat it. Never sweat the fact that your characters don't look perfect yet. Whatever, take whatever you can get. Whatever the face ends up being, that's okay. If it ends up looking like one particular trope, who cares? Right now what you're trying to build is better habits when it comes to knowing what to do with your brush at what time. The last thing you should be worried about is creating people. You're not yet skilled enough to be creating people. And that's the truth of the matter. Get that skill down. Get the geometric anatomy awareness down. So you can start painting people that are believable, that are realistic. One really, really important block for the upper part of the chin. It's not the whole chin that's glowing. The chin doesn't glow. Write that back, please. It's a serious epidemic here. The chin doesn't glow, okay? And there's like, I would say, another transitional cheekbone value just here. And another kind of sub cheekbone shadow value right here that's part of the beard shadow. Maybe it's lighter, honestly, it doesn't really matter. And then we have, it just depends on the kind of face. Again, it doesn't matter who you're creating right now. You have no business worried, worrying about that. So these are the blocks that you actually see me paint. I'll take shortcuts. Don't copy me because I'm, I, I'm, I'm skilled with the portrait. I know what I'm doing. I know which direction I'm going for. So if you see my processes on those time-lapse videos that I've been releasing, um, don't copy that. Go through this process. You need to build this habit. All right. The chin only has one upper value. Excellent. It doesn't grow. It doesn't glow. Sorry. Don't cast any shadows while blocking just yet. We're, we have no, you have no business casting shadows. No business worrying about any of that other stuff. Really. All right, and I'm just combining these two sides together to finish off the face. All right, so right now we do have a trope coming through and that trope is beauty. Uh, large eyes, small mouth, small nose. You can, I mean, of course, when we, when we flip something, it kind of looks freaky. So I would uh, enlarge the, the, the chin, I mean the nose uh, bridge just a little bit so it doesn't look completely Michael Jackson and uh, making sure that the cheeks have a little bit more highlighter on them because if we were to cast this into some shadow we would have problems and then now we blend so I'm duplicating the layer getting my smudge brush so if anyone's interested in Portrait Studio it'll be on sale and any sales made after the from the fourth first of June to the 14th will be added to a raffle one of my mods came up with this idea and the winner of the raffle will win three Portrait Studio um, I mean three classes with me private tutoring classes and um, I may do this I may not depending on my uh, summer curriculum and how many students book with me. If I have a slot left, I will absolutely do this. But uh, it's most likely that I will, even if I do have a heavy curriculum, I can offer at least three. Ideally, the best curriculum would be for five sessions. That's five weeks, one session a week. But three weeks is, is also a very generous amount of time. All right, so we're gonna start blending. Um, I don't like I don't like how similar some of these values are, so I'm just going to adjust them. And this isn't this isn't to do if so if you start freaking out. Oh, she adjusted her values. Uh, blocking in isn't reliable. It's absolutely reliable. We still have our edges, right? We still have the edges that we need here, right where they're supposed to be. And just like any form study, after you apply the edges of the cube, after you create the quick uh, lasso representation of your form study you're going back and adjusting the values to make sure that they represent the light source 100%. We still have our edges in place. And now we blend. 
We're starting with the largest pockets and we're blending around each edge. Make sure when you're using the smudge brush your brush strokes are uh, large and they're low opacity. Shrinking my brush here and blending this. Um, at Istabrak, if you want any questions answered, um, at Istabrak, can we book private tutoring at any time? Yes, the slots are always available. There's always, you know, there's no booking period. You just apply, and if there's a slot, it's offered to you. Which one of your brushes do you recommend for blending skin? Um, like I said, I've always recommended using the smudge brush to blend anything. But one of my favorite brushes to use for blending skin would be possibly the, the entire set of skin and blending, but the one that I would love, I love the most, is this one. So, oopsie, I put that on smudge brush. Let me use it. So it's the number one smudge, uh, number one of the set. The refined one. And it's just really great for blending. Opacity is low. And I'm just using the eyedropper method, which I don't blend with. I do not blend this way. Skin and blending brushes are brushes that you can still block with, but you'll still get a, a tapered edge every time you want to work with you know, work toward a faster finish. But I don't blend like this. I blend with the smudge tool, which is my number four smudge. I blend the way I would blend with traditional, actually reorganizing re the values. This blocking set actually is wrong because half the eyeball is sometimes in light. So we for I forgot to relieve the eyeball from the shadow of the eye socket and that means that the lower eyelid is also not within the eye socket shadow so it gets a brighter degree oops a brighter degree of value that six percent does nothing for me All right, so we just we're just blocking in a little bit more, and now I'm blending out the cheekbones. So it's just a wide ass face. I'm just using the the, the student, whatever the student was doing earlier. Um, it's a bit wide for my taste or what I usually draw. The mouth is downward facing. There's an expression. It's accidental. I'm blending away at the chin. So now we know that all of our you know, our, our values from the top of the sphere to the lower part are, are right where they're supposed to be per the geometric anatomy. Everything is accurate. Everything is where it's supposed to be. As for the features looking all funky, that's just, you know, me working with the student's plate and excessive Barbie doll features here, which is a sign of beginners. Beginners just go straight for the beauty 100%. It's just, it, it's it's something that you guys do that I'm okay with, as long as you eventually move away from the Barbie doll face. There needs to be a slight block here for the brow structure. I wouldn't want to carry that shadow all the way up. I don't over blend around the eyes. I reserve that area for when I'm blending later with detail. If this, is, if this is all you can manage for your day one 14 day challenge, it's still a success because what you're doing is you're creating a three dimensional base. It's still three dimensional. It's still working in that you're representing real preliminary anatomy, right? You're still representing real anatomy. This is a, this is a very accurate depiction of light on form for this particular object. And it's in its measurements. And I'm just eyeballing the symmetry. And whenever you're ready for it, start bringing in the dark spots. The dark spots are the next step. 
basically areas of the highest contrast. And I would bring in the cast shadow of the nose next. What are the six dark, dark spots again? For those who don't know, who should know. Don't know what they are. It's very, very dangerous. I'm not sure why. If, any, if you don't know what the six dark spots are, you should not be painting a face. And what their significance is when it comes to control and contrast. What are the six dark spots and why are they important? What is their particular quality that we have to remember them as the six dark spots? Why do we single them out as the only six dark spots? Why aren't there more six dark spots or dark spots around the face? And this is your basic blocking in. And then what we have before... is the fact that all of this stuff is missing in your before. You don't have a base shape for the nose, you just have a general interpretation of what the nose is doing. You have intense value sharing because you forgot to treat the side of the nose as separate as a mountain. And the eye socket values are nothing compared to the side of the nose values. They're not the same. Look at that jump. big jump between the eye socket and the sides of the nose and in yours not that big a jump and it just goes right back to it for the top of the nostrils why are the top of the nostrils in shadow if the block is telling us only the lower part of the nose is pointing it away from the light they're iconic to the face um, they're the, either cavities or high contrast features um, it's the opposite of an elevation. Cavities, yeah, good job. Um, so they are cavities. What are the cavities of the face? Which ones are the cavities of the six dark spots? So I'm saying six dark spots. Two of the dark spots, two of the six are the eyes. And the eyes are a general dark spot that I refer to. There's many opportunities of pure black in the eye structure from the eyebrows and hairline which is pigmentation to the pupils which are pigmentation. Uh, lower eyelashes which are pigmentation and eye crease which is a, a like a butt crack it's just a big cavity that extends as a trench. And then the other two are the nostrils and the lip corners. Nostrils being the deepest cavities which you would need to block in first as a, a teardrop shape and then slowly uh, taper your way into the nostril making sure that you're radially representing the, the, the slow ascent into the shadow which is a descent as well in value and then the, the lip corners need to be radially addressed I'm not going to talk about that today because I'm not, it's not a tutorial on how to paint a face from scratch I have uh, faces so many fundamentals go into it that um, you would need to watch a couple more videos to you know, really cover everything that you need to know about the face from start to finish. And if you need your hand held 100% of the time, again, um, you need to think about the way you're processing this information, organizing the, your interaction with the information, um, getting a pr different perspective on your interaction with the information, trying different ways and then revisiting the information, actually doing mileage, actually painting more. Work on your discipline. It's not just, oh, this is the first painting I've done in two months. I expect it to be perfect. No way in hell. There is no dimension in this universe and other universes that where, uh, in the cosmos, where you try something for the first time and you're going to succeed without absolute dumb luck. You, that's not possible. There is always theory behind success and practice behind success. And if you're failing at something you expect it to be simple, it wasn't as simple as you imagined it. That's step one. Step two, you didn't really know everything you thought you knew. Can you explain about how much the value should change, especially between the cheeks and the nose that makes the difference? It's relative. As long as it's a value drop that, that looks acceptable. That, I mean, this is something you're learning when you're doing form studies. You're learning how to make the values move without it looking like a completely different val color or, or value. You're learning how to make the values move so that the mid-tone still looks like it's the same color of the object. You guys paint 
like the shadow and the highlight are entirely new values and colors. The highlight and the shadow should just still be the midtone, just slightly darker and slightly lighter. So if this is the highlighter, and this is the value drop, and then this is the cheek, I mean, this is an acceptable separation between, you're still working in the midtones. you haven't jumped into an entire new neighborhood. And this is an entirely new neighborhood, compare that to the highlighter of the nose. As long as you're having these kinds of separations, but technically, as long as you're in the neighborhood, you're choosing the right value. <clears throat> Can you please start a new trend? 14 day challenge for figure drawing, maybe a demo and some rules like the pose, etc. I didn't start the 14 day challenge as a trend. It's an actual, it takes 14 days to 22 days or something to build a habit. So I'm working within a theory here. I'm working within a principle that I'm teaching you habit and painting every day. And 14 days is a lot of, a lot of time from doing the same subject. You're gonna improve in that time, amount of time. It's a lot of time to work on one object or one specific subject, which is a portrait. You can do 14 days for any other object you want. You don't need me to start a trend for that. You can do one for hands. You can do one for, you know, it's just about the fact that 14 days is good for habit building. I'm a huge perfectionist and it makes it hard for me to draw and actually finish my 14 days. Is there anything I can do to fix that or should I just give up? Um. No, don't give up. Uh, if you keep giving up on your 14 day challenge because you don't want to do the work or it gets boring, this is a problem outside of art. This is a problem in your life. This is, this is you not making your bed every morning. This is you quitting halfway through everything else you've done. This is you being lazy with homework since you were in school. This is a, a discipline problem that you have essentially as a person. This is you going to the gym for only a week and then giving up. This is you starting a workout, expecting an improvement after the first workout. This has everything to do with who you are as a person. 14 day challenge isn't particular, particularly difficult that everyone shares equal in their failure. Some people finish it, some people start it and finish it. And that's because they have predispositions in their life that are not, uh, that are promoting the completion of tasks and not the giving up on tasks. Maybe it's a bad habit you learned from your parents. Maybe your parents were particularly hardworking, or maybe your parents didn't finish tasks, or maybe they're, and I'm sorry, I'm being very honest, maybe they're obese, maybe they don't work out, maybe they taught you laziness instead of hard work. Maybe you're carrying habits you don't know, and you're wondering why you're failing at something that is only 14 days long. So you have to ask the question, have I really been disciplined enough? Do I, have I ever really finished anything? And me not finishing something, is this a sign of my problems, my habits? Is this something I learned from someone else? How do I work on it? The best thing that I did to remedy this, and I grew up in a very lazy household, full of lazy, fat, you know, um, and they didn't really get anything done in their lives. Uh, they just lived day to day, paycheck, government paycheck to government paycheck. Um, the way I learned discipline, going to the gym every day, cleaning my bed, making my bed every day, is from the small tasks. The small tasks add up and they add up to make you more of a dis disciplined person, a better leader, a better, more um, a serious about your work, a better work ethic. Uh, you as a human being are, are serious, are a serious person. Um, you don't joke about everything. Not everything is a joke. You make sure that you pay your rent on time, your bills are paid on time, you're punctual. These are the things that lead to your success everywhere else. I've never met an artist that is fundamentally uh, a successful artist, let me say, is that is fundamentally lazy. Um, they can be lazy in other respects. Maybe they redirected their, their capacity so that it's all focused on art, so they're not necessarily the best at exercise, but they do get the work done when it's time to get it done. They have a good idea, with that. like they have good home track uh, of, of completing homework in school, they have good grades in school. There's always a reason why they're successful. You don't just, you're not just born talented. There's a work that goes into it. And if you're a hard worker, you don't notice the work and you just get better in no time. So if you're a huge perfectionist, I don't think you're as much a perfectionist as you think if you're giving up that early. I think your perfectionism is an excuse for not finishing work. I think you may think you're a perfectionist, uh, but fundamentally, um, perfection 
perfectionism is uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's just an excuse. I would just call it an excuse. It's more of a, a, a like a scapegoat from work. It's saying that I have a vision for how good it's supposed to be. And because this vision is so good, I'm not going to do it. No, that's laziness. The vision that you're seeing is that far away and you're seeing the distance between you and that far away perfect thing and you don't want to cross that distance. Why? Because it looks too hard. So I've never heard of someone who is a perfectionist who is also lazy. A perfectionist usually is someone who is not afraid of doing the work, who keeps doing the work until it's perfect. I think what you're doing is just using perfectionism to view the work. You can actually see the work. You do have a vision of how perfect it's supposed to be. You're looking at, what's the word? God damn it. Uh, you're you're looking for the uh, uh, the the homework that you know that other people are doing. You're you're seeing how good their their work is, and you're seeing how much work you have to finish, and you're not up for it. That's a discipline problem. Can you please give tips on how to make sure your values make sense with your light source? That's a form study problem. If you're having issues with that, you should not be trying a portrait. Um, you should be trying uh, some form studies. Form studies help you choose the right values at the right time, consider the light source when you need to consider it. Um, uh, they, they help you with all kinds of stuff. Do I find blocking easier or harder with a sketched out, uh, laid out first? Okay, I'm just going to make it an official announcement. It's okay to sketch out your face for 14 day challenge. It's okay. These are just the foundation working lines. They're just blueprint lines. They're nothing. Um, as long as you change your, as long as you shift, and write this back to me, as long as your lines become edges, it's okay to start with a sketch. doesn't matter what it is. It could be anything. Traditional professional pencil artists do this, which eventually, they eventually turn their drawings into full 3D rep uh, representations with pencil. It doesn't mean that the line sticks around. If the line sticks around, it's not going to work. Okay. Um, do I have any tips for checking my values are correct for a light environment? Um, so you guys really do have this issue. Uh, the background has to be the brightest thing. Your highlighter and your background can be very similar to each other because it's catching the light as well as the nose is very high, high oil, high reflectivity oil and water reflect light the best. The darkest value should not be that small a dark, uh, that, that low a dark value, because there's a lot of bounce light from this bright environment. So the highlighter and the background are similar. One can be darker, one can be lighter, it doesn't matter, it's just who's oilier and who's, who has a brighter exposure. It's not, it's not a, there's no, there's no formula for it. And then the mid-tone should not be that big a jump from your highlighter mid-tone. So your mid-tone and your highlighter should still be in the same neighborhood. Do you see how they're both from this general area? So just measure it with the width of your nail, I guess. Your highlighter and like the width of your nail vertically and horizontally. The highlighter and the mid-tone should be a small jump within that. And then the highlight and the mid-tone and the shadow is quite a big jump. So I would say it's half your pinky. But this is a socket shadow. This shadow down here and the mid-tone are probably a little bit more than a nail's worth. And then the highlighter from the shadow, is, I would say, is half the, half the pinky size. Again, this is, this is my pinky, and my pinky's two inches long, an inch long, I don't know, and um, my pinky finger. And the mid-tone and the shadow should be like... A little bit less than I'm just trying to give you like honest to God like measuring because I know you that's what you guys want at the end of the day that's what you're really asking me is right give us specific values um, I can't because sometimes light environments are different uh, as long as they're not they're not massive jumps from each other and as long as the shadow is the lowest jump you and it's not so much of a jump that it looks like there is a big black splotch just coming across the face just right there. Uh, as long as it's this not kind of not this kind of shadow, you're good. Uh, is it okay for our students to use lasso to help keep the edges? Absolutely. It gives you a good standard for clean edge, and a standard for clean edge is a um, 
uh, anything that promotes it, I'm for it. A lasso, you'll eventually not need to use it so much. Um... Um, uh, when, when I paint a subject, how many different brushes do I use? Right now I'm just using one. If you're using a standard round, you're doing yourself a disservice. You should be looking for a blocking brush. My sets have a good a number of blocking brushes. They have high textured brushes, they have low textured brushes, but they all promote blocking. Most of the early dry oil brushes, all of dry oil brushes are preliminary brush strokes. One brush stroke, one brush set, and the sketching brushes is um, uh, also a blocking brush with minimal texture because it's a marker brush. Uh, I, I'm, there's just so many options for blocking, and there's you can make your own. It, it's it's you just should not be using a standard round. A standard round is not helping you chisel in those polys that we discovered today. Okay. Um, scrolling all the way up for questions. Um, so does this mean that in the blocking phase, uh, the portrait should look similar to the low poly head model? Should I sketch the face or just start with the blocks? You, should, you can sketch the face if you have a particular character you're going for. If you don't care about the character, then don't sketch it. If you're sketching it because you want to manage anatomy, sketch it. You can sketch. You're allowed to sketch. Okay. Um, so does this mean that the blocking phase of the portrait should look similar to the low part? I already read that. Um, uh, I'm a 14 day challenge graduate. Will my work be critiqued? This is the fifth time I'm asking. I'm so sorry. I just want an answer. I'm, 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 I don't critique every single graduate of the 14 day challenge. Um, that's not how it works. I just critique whoever I find that is similar or relevant to the topic I'll be discussing that day. You should be getting critiques from your fellows. Um, a critique from me, I know it's very sought after, but it's not always promised. Um, am I inspired by any artists in this period? Uh, that's a very big question. You guys can ask me that in after hours if I do that again. I'm so sorry, Fabiano. There's just so many artists I wouldn't know where to start. Um, do I have to use the lasso tool to block in, or can I just paint them in with a blocking brush? You don't have to use the lasso tool. I just used it because it helped me today to um, uh, define some stuff. Thank you so much for all you said to me. Honestly, I'm like mind blown. I saw my life flash. I'm lazy shit. I work out a lot, um, uh, but work is a mess. My homework is piled up as a youngling. So yeah, your 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 ability to not finish the 14 day challenge isn't. Um, a sign of your lack of knowledge or something. It's a bigger problem in your life. What The way I fixed my laziness back when I started getting bad grades and I was in university and I was having a rough time staying on top of my work, I built a, a habit. I built a, a routine. I said every single day before I start writing an essay or doing a reading or doing any kind of homework, I am going to make my bed. And I made my bed and I made it perfect. And that led to me wanting to vacuum my room. And so I vacuumed my room and everything felt so clean and clear. I, I felt like I was cleaning my mind and preparing it and emptying it out so that when it was time to do work, I deserved the work. The work was the reward and I got the real work out of the way, which was the cleaning. So me making it so that I had to clean my, uh, my room made it so that I had like this military general over my head saying, you, you know, you, you have to clean your room or else you get... 500 laps or some dumb shit like that and that's how I had my own little sergeant or like one little drill drill sergeant in my head yelling at me um, to make sure that I cleaned my room and made my bed and in the army they actually make you make your bed every single day that's because it starts from the second you wake up it starts from waking up at the right time building yourself a, a, a good foundation of daily discipline putting your mind in the right spot and having a better relationship with your work so after I started making my bed and cleaning my room, I got to the work and that made it so that homework was, you know, part of my homework was making my bed. And that made it so that the other homework was easy to slide right into. Um, would you consider teaching traditional animation? Um, I'm not a master of traditional animation. I know some animation discipline, but I don't really 
wouldn't call myself a master of it so I could teach it. Um, yeah, I can't work in a messy room. A messy house, I mean, you know me, guys. You, you know who I am. You know that I teach and I and I do all of this stuff and I clean my room. So if you're trying to, to, to you know, be at the skill level I'm in or if you're trying to mimic my lifestyle, just know if, if I'm like a role model of some kind for you, I clean my room every single day. I clean my whole house every single day. Um, and cleaning is a massive part of discipline and developing a better work ethic. Um, thanks, Isterback. I can see the problem in my life and I'm going to fix it. And if you have parents or a work life or, or, or colleagues or friends that are dragging you down, remember that they, at a certain level, should stop influencing you. If you have messy, dirty, nasty friends, if you have messy, lazy parents, um, they are not who you are. You should start surrounding yourself with people that you want to become like. And cleaning, good hygiene, showering every day is the first step to completing your 14-day challenge. I'm serious. It all comes full circle back to showing up to your canvas and doing the work and enjoying the work. <clears throat> um, all right, I'm going to finish up now. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Really, really massive announcements, though, that I've saved to the end. Uh, Portrait Studio sale this week, uh, Friday tomorrow midnight um and if you want to buy it go to isterac.com slash store just go to isterac.com and click on the store tab Porsche studio will go up to 90 dollars after the sale um at the third week of june we're sending out a massive update for all the ui all the objects new objects are coming in uh new features um lots of the stuff that you've been waiting for i'm releasing a trailer tomorrow or saturday announcing um, the sale. Uh, if you have it and you love it, please recommend it to your friends. It supports us. Um, if you've been waiting for it, wait until the sale. Don't buy it tomorrow or anything. It's on sale at 50 off. This is a benefit to you. It's not to me. I benefit more when you buy it at full price. Uh, so just wait. I, I make this sale happen so that you guys, if you need it for your edu- I mean, you saw how educationally useful it is today. So if you need it for this kind of purpose so that you can get um, a better accurate, because a portrait studio, if you're having trouble choosing lights and midtones and shadows, you can literally drop to a portrait studio's lights, midtones and shadows for your drawings. You saw what we did today here. These are portrait studio's values. Okay, and you can use these for your 14 day challenge. There's nothing wrong with choosing values. Values belong to no one. Um, they are values. Uh, and they are accurate ones that you're learning and picking up from Portrait Studio. So if you need Portrait Studio for this kind of thing, wait for tomorrow um, midnight to buy it. And um, if you find it beneficial, recommend it to your friends. Spread the word that the sale is up. It will be down after a week, um, because after two weeks, sorry, because I can't really keep it running for a very long time. But if it doesn't fit within your pay cycle, message me on Facebook and I'll give you a promo code. But that's only acceptable for June if you're missing out on the sale um, until then, if you're like a straggler. Um, I don't know, I might just extend the sale if, if, if a lot of people are messaging me, if there's tons of stragglers. Um, and uh, there is a current challenge running in the, in the, in the, in the community. Uh, make sure that you guys are reading and, and looking into that. Uh, if you want to support me on Patreon, please do. Um, you get a lot of educational material back. Uh, and I don't work with any marketing or any kind of agencies. Everything I do, I do here with the support of my patrons. So if everybody joined for $5, $1, you're still sending out a lot of, a lot of support. Um, and if you want educational material, uh, you can join as an apprentice or initiate or pupil. Thank you everyone for joining today. I'll see you guys on Tuesday at uh, 5 p.m. Eastern time, Tuesday the 4th. Bye everyone.